I was 14 when I started. So, you know, what are you going to say about yourself when you're 14? There's not much to say. You are, everything is happening outside of yourself. So a lot of things that I do, I'm talking about myself in some ways inadvertently or indirectly. It's cathartic without being obviously cathartic. But that's true with writing, too. Right. You know, right. very much the same. The writing becomes a greater life. I keep a hotel room in my town, wherever I live, and I leave my house about 5.30 in the morning. Oh my goodness. And so I go into my room. I close the door. Once I'm there, I will go and I'll kind of cleanse myself. I don't know how I do that. But I get out anything that happened last night or on the drive over there away from me. So I'm back with, the, with my work. You know what's different about their process than mm -hmm. mine? That's almost like a quantum leap different. Is the absence of people. I need, I need the people so bad. I can't write in a vacuum. And sometimes the inspiration won't hit you until you're in front of the people. And then you look at somebody's face and you be like, this might be interesting. I'll tell this person about that. Anyone here ever get divorced? What happened, man? What broke you up? Just open up, man. I'm Montel, nigga. Tell me, just tell me everything. Because I need people so much for my process, something about celebrity interrupts the process. Oh, I see. Because in order to do what I do, I have to be comfortable with making mistakes. Okay. The saying being nothing is more painful than watching a comedian grow. When Chappelle's show first broke big, the stand-up thing was a little hard for me because it changed. I would walk on stage and I had like this, this rock star energy. People were listening to me different. They weren't even really listening. And I'd walk out on stage and I'd be like, hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Rick James, bitch. Oh, I'd be a lady in the front row crying like I'm like I'm the Beatles. I can't believe he's in front of me. Oh. Camera phones in my face, like, you know. And I was like, I don't like this as much. Listen to what's happening. People are shouting out shit at me that I've already said in TV and movies. I'm like a comedy jukebox. That nigga just put a quarter in me. I deserve to die. What used to be a, a real connection between me and the audience had become more superficial. What happens to you when you get a bigger laugh or a laugh when you didn't expect one or a bigger one than you expected? What happens on that occasion? Then I want to know what happens when you expected the lab and nothing happened. That's very interesting. With laughter, when I'm at my best, I'm not looking for it. I love it. But you kind of get sensitive to how, how people laugh. When I left my show was because I did this sketch. And I knew what I intended, but somebody laughed differently than I intended. And I caught it. The other people around were like, what are you talking about? It's like, I heard too many. I, I know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm, I'm certain of it. And, uh, you know, it was painful. <laughs> Whenever I hear like he fled to South Africa, I'm like, man, I, I walked out, I walked like John Wayne. But I wasn't walking away from money. I was walking away from the perfect storm of bullshit. They told you I was in an insane asylum. They told you maybe he smokes crack. They told you everything but the truth. Maybe corporate America fucks with human beings like their products and investments. Maybe a motherfucker brings into a room and says, this $50 million, this pile of money, it's all for you. And when you try to grab it, he just throws his dick right on top of the pile. <laughs> I don't want to be co-opted or subverted. I don't want to be my own worst enemy or, or be used against myself. And that's what happens to, to public people. I think that's why I'm so fascinated by it the group of artists that you came from.
like James Baldwin. That kind of blows my mouth. These are people who like mm. we have postage stamps up. Amen. <laughs> you know Amen. what I mean? Like, Amen. And these Amazing. are your crowd. Yeah, these are your, these are your homies, so to speak. Yep. Did you know Malcolm X? Oh my dear. Yes, very well. He's a truly American phenomenon. Yes. So is Mike. No, absolutely. The two of them were both friends of mine. So when you talk to me, you're talking at once in history, but to my life. To every human grouping, whether it's just two people, a family, people in the neighborhood, people in the city, in a nation, a tribe, a species, people live in direct relation to the heroes and the sheroes they have. There was a certain consciousness that was the backdrop of my upbringing, you know. We would have like Malcolm X pictures hanging up in our house kind of a counterculture upbringing, like the things that I knew about that I was starting to understand were not in everybody's homes. At Martin King's request, I rejoined the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because I had left him to go to Malcolm. Was it really separated movements like that? Oh, my goodness. When Malcolm was in the States, it was so separated. Uh, Malcolm even made Martin look like a, a Tom until he understood what was happening. Right, right. And, but that's a wonderful thing about the icon. You continue to grow, and you develop courage, the most important of all the virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. If you've seen another truth and had enough courage to change your way of thinking, to say, hey, everybody, you know what I said last week? I don't believe that anymore. A little child just straightened me out. This was the mark of Martin and of Malcolm. So when Malcolm X came to Africa and came to us in West Africa, in Ghana, he said, I have met blue-eyed, blonde-haired, white men at Mecca, and I can call them brother. I have, I have, I have learned not all whites are the devils. It's important for you to talk about exactly. these people. Exactly. And remind me of the humanity because as icons, the level of virtue they have seems impossible. This is why it's dangerous to make anybody seem larger than life. Because a young person coming up sees this larger than life figure, this outrageously gigantic personality, and has to say, I can never be that. I can never do that. Absolutely. You see, when the truth is, those men and those women were in the right place at the right time and got hold of something. And something caught hold of them. This is something that I just now, in this stage of my life, I'm getting an appreciation for. And maybe being a public person kind of helped me appreciate it. But what the 60s must have been like for anybody. What was it, eight or nine assassinations? What does that do to a generation? Having lived through that and having known those people, this is me. I, I imagine I'd, I'd still be angry. I'd be angry at my country. I'd be angry at anybody who let that happen to my friends. Oh, if you're not angry, you're either a stone are you too sick to be angry? You should be angry. But what are you doing? You, now, mind you, there's a difference. You must not be bitter. That's a hard ah, that's Let a me hard. show you why. Bitterness is like cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. So use that anger, yes. You write it, you paint it, you dance it, you march it, you, you vote it, you do everything about it, you talk it. Never stop talking it.